Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I know a couple more people are going to be jumping on the call, so hopefully we get to them um, during introductions. We can always follow up with them again. Um, Dr. Zolfikar is going to be giving our didactic today. Um, and so if you guys have questions, just hold those to the end. We're going to start with introductions. And let's see, Sam Giordano, do you mind to start for us? Uh, good morning. Thank you, uh, Caitlin. I'm uh, Sam Giordano. I'm a a res registered respiratory therapist, retired, and currently chair of the US COPD Coalition. Perfect, thank you. Um, and Grace Ann? Let's see, you might be muted. I'm still Grace Ann Dorney Campbell. I'm president of the Dorney Campbell Foundation and uh, co sponsor and co founder of um, 12 of the respiratory um, clinics. Perfect, thank you. All right, and then Caitlin Grados. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, it's uh, Caitlin Grados from UPMC's Black Lung Clinic. I'm a respiratory therapist. I also have Nicole Donahue with me here. She's also a respiratory therapist in the clinic. Awesome, thank you both. All right, we have somebody named C. Jin. And you might be muted. Hi, good morning everyone. I'm occupational medicine physician at WVU. Awesome, thank you for joining. All right, and Mitra? Hey guys, I'm Mitra Motasham, uh, one of the Project ECHO coordinators uh, with Caitlin. Thank you. Great, thanks. All right, uh, and it says Sangani, is that Raul? Hi, this is Raul Sangani. I'm a co-worker with Dr. Zulfikar and current faculty with Palm Critical Care at uh, WVU. Awesome, thank you for joining today. All right, and we got a chat in from Aaron. Let's see, unable to connect microphone, but can you hear? And Aaron is from ACMH Hospital. Thank you, Aaron. All right, uh, Diana. Yes, good morning. This is Diana from the Pennsylvania Rural Health Model. Good morning, everyone. Great, thank you for joining. And let's see, I see Dr. Weissman. Ooh. Yes, good morning, David Weissman from NASH. Great, thank you. All right, and let's see, Dr. Zulfikar, do you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. My name is Rafi. I'm one of the assistant professors in pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine at WVU. Um, I am privileged every time I get an opportunity to speak uh, on, on this forum, and thank you so much for giving me this time. Absolutely. We're so happy to have you. Um, let's see, Dr. Doyle, you joined. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? You might be muted. Okay, no worries. Anybody, if you had trouble introducing yourself, please feel free to chat us in. Um, and we'll also take chat for anybody who hops on after this. So Dr. Zulfikar, we are ready for you if you want to share your screen. It says host disabled attendee oh, here. sharing. So sorry. No problem. Zoom updated a couple of different times and it started doing weird things. And I, was... I had updated this morning too. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. Try now. Okay. Can you guys see? Yes. All right. So I have to say that um, when, I, when I was looking through the topic that I'm supposed to speak at, uh, I was a little stumped because I really didn't know much um, other than what I've read briefly, given, you know, me, me, me being a pulmonologist. But uh, I even debated if I should request a different topic or request a different subtopic of epidemiology of air pollution. And then I decided, well, it, it's a learning opportunity for me. Um, so I put together a very short, very short presentation, actually, about 20 slides uh, of, as a pulmonologist, what I tend to think of 
uh, living in the United States when it comes to air pollution and how it affects my patient population and also some of the epidemiology because believe it or not when I went uh, when I went to learn about the epidemiology of air pollution and you know you this is a broad topic it can include the United States it includes West Virginia does it include the world does it include the third world countries there is so much that um, I found myself kind of, kind of going to going down the rabbit hole uh, but I decided to concise and pull it together specifically briefly related to United States and then West Virginia. So, let's see. so effects of air pollution. So we'll start with a basic statement. Air pollution is essentially a mixture of natural and man-made substances in the air we breathe. Ambient air pollution is one of the biggest avoidable um, and I put avoidable in the quotations um, because that's the key word, environmental threats to human health and is estimated to contribute to 2.9 million deaths annually across the globe. That was a surprise to me. I, I had never thought that it would be such a big impact. We all, I think, have this innate feeling or, well, I shouldn't say innate, but professionally speaking, that air pollution does have a lot of harmful um, effects on your health and probably adds to the morbidity of the underlying diseases, but um, it actually has a direct mortality effect. Uh, World Health Organization uh, website actually had a wealth of information on air pollution across the world and, you know, um, over the years how that has changed. So I decided to put some of the data here um, where, where, they, where they mentioned that about 91% of the world population uh, it was living in places where the air quality guidelines were not being met. That's a lot of people. Almost nine out of 10 individuals across the world living in urban areas are affected by air pollution. And by affected, they meant morbidity and mortality. Current air pollution frequently found in urban areas is a dynamic and complex mixture of both man-made, that is anthropogenic and natural sources. Six common ambient air pollutants are, um, and, I, and I decided to put it, this here because I don't think I, as a physician, tend to think about, oh, what are the air pollutants? I know there's carbon dioxide, there's carbon monoxide, and maybe ozone, and, and I never thought beyond that. Uh, particulate matter being one, ozone being the new and emerging um, air pollutant, um, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, carbon monoxide, and lead. Um, I, I ended up reading a lot about the particulate matter because it, it seems like obviously particulate matter has a variety of size limit. You know, there's a variety of or a wide array of size that a particulate matter can be. And it is usually the 2.5 um, or the size of the particle that is known to um, deposit inside our lungs, for example, or even get carried away by macrophages and get deposited in different parts of our body and actually have the long-term side effects. Uh, PM 2.5 is how it is described as. It describes fine inhalable particles with a diameter generally 2.5 micrometers and smaller. So this, this slide essentially tells us about the age-related effects. And I'm not a pediatrician, I don't treat pediatric population at all, but I, I feel like if we have to understand the impact of air pollution on an adult's health, one has to think about what the air pollution uh, did to that patient or to that person when they were children or adolescents. Uh, so we know that children and adolescents are more susceptible to the effects of air pollution than adults. So children, for example, growing up in uh, places like um, cities in California, um, New York City, have a different impact on their pulmonary health as compared to people, say, growing in West Virginia. Um, the human respiratory system develops in utero to adolescence. Birth to approximately six years of age represent the greatest period of postnatal development with formation of more than 80% of new alveoli. We, we know that to some degree, right? From birth, about six to eight years, we have, our, we have the maximum amount of growth and uh, adaptation of the, the lung tissue. The good news is that most of the studies that have looked into effect of population on, during those early, uh, effect of pollution, sorry, during those early years on lung health and then subsequently removing those individuals from the exposure, there was some positive effect on lung function growth in children. Uh, from the age of 11 to 15, reported by Gordon and colleague in 20, 2015. Elderly population is what we most, what forms most of the chunk of our population. Um, they are more susceptible to inflammation, respiratory complications due to air pollution. 
Uh, but I specifically put the slide in there because I, as an adult pulmonary physician, have to think about the childhood or adolescent uh, exposures that has finally led to that younger uh, patient to my clinic. And air pollution does play a role. So I decided to divide the talk uh, in terms of, you know, what I take, um, what I take uh, is clinically important uh, from, the si from the point of view of air pollution. So I placed asthma and a couple of other lung diseases at the forefront and then kind of dwelled into the epidemiology of it, uh, which, uh, which is coming up. So asthma being the first one, we know that exposure to particulate matter, specifically the particulate matter with the size of 2.5, exacerbates allergic inflammation in the lung. Uh, I think as a pulmonologist or even as a general physician practicing in the United States dealing with patients with asthma, we know that that's the case. Ozone, on the other hand, other than particulate matter, which we have known for years and studied for years, ozone has been shown to cause oxidative stress, inflammatory response, and immunologic disease. Now, we tend to think of ozone as the protective layer of, of the environment, which is higher up um, um, in the stratosphere. However, there are two types of ozone. So one is the higher up ozone that is in the stratosphere, about 12 kilometers above um, the earth um, surface. That is the ozone that pr protects us from the UV rays. Uh, however, the ozone produced at a local level right around the surface of the earth, which usually happens from um, emissions, carbon emissions from the factories, the vehicles, tends to be the pollutant that we're talking about. Um, sulfur dioxide, for example, it affects the airway inflammation immune responses. There were studies done in rats that had shown enhanced response or asthmatic uh, exacerbations um, when sulfur dioxide was exposed to the airway. In 2013, a Framingham Heart Study found short-term exposure to particulate matter of the size 2.5 ozone and nit nitrous dioxide were associated with lower FEV1 and FVC in non-smoking adults. I think that is a very significant, um, very significant uh, study or a very significant uh, learning point for me because when we see our patients in the state of West Virginia, we tend to think about, well, we have COPD, you have to be a smoker, or you have COPD, you have to be a coal miner. When uh, in reality, there is environmental factors and environmental exposures that do predispose you predispose non-smoking adults to such a disease. Uh, poor air quality due to high levels of ozone has been shown to not only contribute to exacerbation of asthma, but also development of asthma. There was a study that had looked at um, some animal models that did not have asthma and post exposure to ozone developed asthma that was persistent. <sighs> if the exposure was taken away over time, the asthma improved but never really got back to normal or it never went away. And I think that again points to the fact that um, the environmental exposures and pollutants have a more long-term effect on our lung function than the short-term effect that we tend to think of. In 2014, um, there was a report uh, of two, uh, particulate matter exposure increasing the risk of asthma, specifically in women. Um, and I know that, uh, you know, women with asthma that is uncontrolled tends to be something that we talk about and debate and discuss. And we have looked at as, you know, as, as a pulmonary community. And there are a lot of um, working theories in terms of, you know, uncontrolled sleep apnea, morbidly obese females or morbidly obese patients tend to have a more uncontrolled asthma. But at the same time, particulate matter exposure, uh, specifically in cities, and I keep stressing on that because of what I've learned from the epidemiology of, of uh, air pollution. The next one being COPD. Um, there was a study in 2015 that had shown prevalence of COPD among non-smokers varies from 1.1% to 40% in different countries. That is a huge number. I mean, 1.1% may not seem as much, but that huge range between 1.1% to 40% uh, means a lot to a pulmonologist. It does because 40% uh, of non-smokers with COPD is uh, beyond something what I would have guessed. But we have to consider that this estimate or this study was a pooling of all the studies from across the country. So that includes countries, uh, the developed nations like United States, England, and the developing nations that, that tend to have the bigger chunk of 
um, air pollution. High incidence of COPD among non-smokers is a large measure associated with indoor air pollution from biomass and secondhand tobacco smoke. That's how we tend to think about, um, you know, third world countries having higher rates of COPD non-smokers. The first thought, and if you look at the statistics, the first most common reason is biomass fuel combustion. Um, but at the same time, if we take that out of the equation, the uh, air pollution that is outdoor pollution plays a big role too. There are some epidemiologic studies showing association between outdoor air pollution and COPD. Uh, subsequently, there was this study that was uh, actually done. Uh, it was a Danish study where they had 57,000 plus participants. Um, you know, they, they looked at the cohort hospital discharge register from 1993, 2006, a pretty long time. And they did, um, you know, annual mean nitrogen oxide and nitrous oxide tests. Their conclusion essentially was long-term exposure to traffic-related air pollution may contribute to the development of COPD. Now, the, the reason this study was interesting is because we're, we know that Denmark is not one of the third world countries. It is a predominantly industrial um, country in the world with, with, the, with the best uh, happiness score, so to speak, that we know of. But here, here, here we have 50,000 plus, 57,000 plus patients who had, who had a very long-term follow-up and uh, they, were able to, they were able to make an association between traffic-related air pollution, which would be way less than as compared to, for example, Beijing or New Delhi. Um, in those people, there was development of COPD and people who had diabetes and asthma, they were more uh, likely to develop COPD. Um, outdoor air pollution and new onset airway disease. This was a statement uh, put out by American Thoracic Society. It was a workshop. Um, the mechanistic group or the workshop group concluded that air pollution exposure can cause airway remodeling, which can lead to asthma or COPD, as well as asthma-like phenotypes that worsen with long-term exposure to air pollution, especially particulate matter and ozone. I think learning about the air pollution and its effects on the lungs has made me a little more sensitive to particulate matter and ozone exposures because they seem to be the main two players and the most common pollutants that you would see. And you, you know, it also depends on where you're, uh, you know, assessing the the pollution. So city versus um, a, a rural uh, setup where you have uh, some kind of a industrial setup, uh, the pollutants would differ. Um, this was a study that had looked at the low and middle income countries. It was a systemic, systematic review and a meta-analysis. So the body of epidemiolo epidemiological evidence regarding the health effects is very large. Um, they had pooled 1,500 plus studies and 91 met the eligibility criteria. Uh, only four, four long-term exposure studies uh, from China were identified. And uh, you know the authors expressed their frustration regarding the fact that some of the most pollutant cities uh, in the world actually come from Southeast Asia, but we did not, they did not have a lot of uh, studies uh, from, from you know, that region. Um, 85 studies across 12 countries is what they looked at, but they specifically picked low and middle income countries. And um, they did show association between short term particulate matter exposure and cardiorespiratory outcomes with stronger risk for mortality than morbidity, which is, a, which is an important statement because Air pollution doesn't only make you sicker. Air pollution doesn't only maybe give you mild asthma or COPD or exacerbate it. It directly contributes to your overall, overall mortality. Uh, when they looked at cardiorespiratory outcomes, they were able to, in a way, form an association between higher risk for coronary artery disease to be very specific and COPD. Um, some of the other studies that I listed here, there was list after list. Um, you know, they were able to point out um, the list here essentially looked at the cardiopulmonary, cardiovascular and lung cancer mortality associated with chronic air pollution exposure. And these were all prospective studies with, with obviously the limitation that any prospective studies would have. In 2012, International Agency for Research in Cancer, IARC, classified diesel exhaust as a group one carcinogen. And that is an important point to remember because diesel exhaust is essentially everywhere, wherever you have diesel um, utilizing vehicles. 
um, something that I learned uh, last year uh, from the presentation that I gave at the Black Lung Conference was that our coal miners who are working in an enclosed mine have been exposed to diesel exhaust for years. And over the years, we have recognized how not only the coal dust and the silica exposure, but the diesel exhaust exposure put them at a higher risk for developing um, airway disease and subsequently lung cancer because it is a carcinogen. In 2013, shortly after, after the diesel exhaust was added to the carcinogen list, um, outdoor air pollution was added to the group one carcinogen list. So we're not just talking about coronary artery disease, COPD, asthma, we're talking about lung cancer and overall, overall mortality uh, with these exposures. Um, fine particulate air pollution, this was one of the NEGM papers actually. Um, they had um, looked at association between life expectancy and fine particulate air matter um, exposure in 51 US metropolitan areas. Essentially, the idea of the study was to see that with the Clean Air Act, was there a difference that was made, actual difference that was made in the life expectancy of Americans? And improvements in life expectancy during the 1980s and 1990s was associated with reduction in fine particulate pollution across the study. Um, this was an encouraging study, uh, at least pointing out that more strict rules, uh, more accountability, uh, more attention to the air pollution, even in uh, you know, a developed country like United States, um, does make a difference in overall um, life expectancy and overall health, cardiovascular and cardiopulmonary health um, uh, in this part of the world. Um, this was essentially a 25-year a global burden um, study which looked at data from across the world. Um, it was a very, very, I, I honestly could not go through the whole study. It, it, it was essentially a more of a, more of a statement. Um, what I learned from, you know, briefly reading through the summary part and looking at what they had looked at was that the global, the global burden of ambient air pollution, now that we're going a little more towards, well, what's the epidemiology? This is the only slide that talks about the global burden and then we go towards United States specifically. The global burden of the disease from ambient air pollution is nearly 8% of all deaths. If we think about the world population and the mortality uh, risks and the, the killers, so to speak, 8% um, is a big number. Um, I think I was able to find a world map um, that essentially points out, it's kind of a color-coded map that includes um, United States here, and here are the percent deaths. So anything in maroon or any shade of red or orange essentially has a death rate or percent death rate from air pollution specifically anywhere between eight to six to seven percent, which is a huge number. And as mentioned earlier, Southeast Asia tends to be in that red hot zone. United States is in this, you know, teal blue or lighter blue shade where we are anywhere between 3.6 to 4 percent. Um, and uh, dark blue is less than 3 percent, which includes Canada, Australia, New Zealand, some parts of Southern Africa. So our nation's air, um, this was a snapshot I got from the website where I was able to actually find out a little bit about the Clean Air Act. Um, in the United States, the average ambient air pollution uh, concentration has drastically decreased and there is data on the EPA website that you know has beautiful graphs year after year after year of data that show us that ambient air pollution has in fact gone down. Um, CAA regulates six criteria air pollutants, carbon monoxide, lead, nitrogen dioxide, ozone, sulfur dioxide, and particulate matter. Um, this is the national trend. This is uh, from 1990 to 2018. And I, I, I wanna you know, specifically point towards um, the ozone, the O3 is the light green, which is here. So the national trend initially was a pretty decent dip and then a plateau since 2008 for last about 12 years. Particulate matter 2.5 is the dark green, which is here in 24 hours. So each 24 hour exposure has significantly gone down. Particulate matter 2.5 is the hot pink here. That is an annual exposure has also gone down between 2000 
all the way to 2018. This is um, a bar graph again that I found on the EPA website. All the data here is from the Environmental Protection um, Agency. Um, this gives us the visual of air quality index, uh, and this is from across United States, not any specific state. Um, over the years, at least in the last 12 years, this has a 10 year, uh, well, 18 year data, and there has been significant improvement in the air quality index. And they have looked specifically for ozone and particulate matter 2.5, size 2.5. Um, air pollution, so they tend to, this is a global website where you can actually find data on every country. And when you go to that country's um, air pollution data, you can also find data on every state. Um, the, the value, so to speak, they give that they have a scoring system to United States is about 8.4. The healthiest state, um, and this is from 2018, so two years old, was New Hampshire with a score of 4.4. And the least healthy state was California. And this is specifically for air pollution. West Virginia score was about 7.6. So we're kind of in the middle. Average exposure uh, of the general public to particulate matter uh, of 2.5 microns or less measured uh, in micrograms per cubic meter for three-year estimate is, is what they were basing the scoring on. So air pollution in West Virginia, this was an interesting topic because, well, we live here, we know it's green, it's beautiful, uh, it doesn't feel like we have air pollution in West Virginia, but I think every, every uh, perspective needs to have a, a, a suitable comparison. If you compare West Virginia with Beijing, we're doing great, right? But the idea is to look at what we have and how can we get better. So uh, the data that I found is not recent. I could not find a more updated 2019 data on this. Um, so 262,000 people in West Virginia live within a half mile uh, radius of active oil and gas operations. We know that. Toxic air pollution in West Virginia specifically comes from the active oil and gas operations and not so much from the vehicular or diesel exhaust, except for when it's when we're talking about inside the coal mines. According to EPA's data for 2011, over 1,200 tons of haz hazardous toxic air pollution, benzene, formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, and other compounds were emitted by oil and gas companies in West Virginia. Um, that is a lot of tons. 1,200 tons is a huge amount. American Lung Association in 2018, just two years ago, uh, had a, a report called State of the Air. And they reported that ozone air pollution in West Virginia has worsened over the span of one year even though the particulate matter, uh, amount of particulate matter suspended in the air actually has gone down. I have to point out that looking at the data from EPA, West Virginia is um, in a better position than average United States um, uh, concentration for particulate matter, but not so for the ozone. Um, I've just placed this cartoon here just to you know, uh, get, a, get a visual idea of where does this ozone essentially come from. Uh, the vehicular exhaust, uh, the nitrous oxide, heat and sunlight combining together, having some chemical reaction, found, uh, makes the ground level ozone or the bad ozone that is emitted directly into the air. Uh, the next one, this graph here taught me about how the ozone air quality, and this is the national trend between 1980 and 2018. So I, I feel like when I see this graph, I do see a dip. So there is a dip between 1980 all the way to, let's say 2009, and then there is a plateau. And that has been the case even for West Virginia, that we have not made a lot of headway or a lot of impact in terms of improving the air quality when it comes to ozone. I found this um, really nice, a basic science diagram that talks about the effects of ozone or daily exposure of ozone. Um, one of them, uh, so it essentially divides it into one day exposure, which causes some epithelial cell death. And we're talking about airway epithelial cells. Um, and then a, a little prolonged um, exposure, for example, nine days, mucous metaplasia, you can have hypertrophic um, hyperplasia, et cetera, and some inflammatory cascade um, causing more, um, as we said, airway, airway remodeling, asthma exacerbations, and COPD exacerbations. I wanted to point out that I know about a year ago, a year and a half ago, one of our nurse practitioners in clinic 
was on phone with a patient of hers and she said that, you know, I know you've had so many exacerbations in the last six months. We have been essentially treating your exacerbations every month. Um, tell me what's new in the house. Did you get a new pet? Did you get, you know, um, did you move to a new apartment? And lo and behold, the patient says, no, I, I in fact bought an, a, an ozone producer, um, a gadget that produces ozone to clean my air, air in the house. <laughs> and and the nurse practitioner, you know, hung up and she talked to the staff and essentially said, you know, how does ozone affect your lungs? And we said, well, it is actually an irritant. So we found out that the patient was actually turning on the ozone purifier or air purifier uh, and just sitting in the same room and kept having exacerbation after exacerbation for almost every month. And the only treatment we had to tell her was to get rid of that. Um, this is the uh, ozone air quality uh, graph that I found. I could not find one specific for West Virginia, so I found one specifically for Northeast. And, you know, as pointed out earlier, uh, in line with the national trend, it seems like from 2004 onwards, we have been at a plateau and we have not made a lot of headway in terms of improvement in the ozone air quality. Um, I think this is I'm coming close to the end slides. I won't be taking much time here, but this was an important map for me for a provider who lives in West Virginia, treats asthma patients, treats patients with lung cancer, or at least sees them for initial diagnosis. Um, this, this heat map, so to speak, was important to me. And this, I think, data is um, at least two years old. I could not find an updated 2019 version. So this talks about cancer risk from oil and gas toxic air emissions and how the southern West Virginia and the parts here are hot red, exceeds the EPA level of concern. And this one here talks about ozone-induced childhood asthma attacks and how the areas in the south, again, are in the hot pink, which is more than 500 cases per year per county. Um, Charleston or um, the southern counties tend to be definitely in the hot zone here. So even though we live in West Virginia, which is a green state, we, we, we do have particulate matter uh, air pollution definitely at a lower level than what it was 50 years ago, uh, lower than national average, but we, we can definitely do better. As providers, I think I I don't think I can go out there and make a policy or you know. Uh, but as a provider, I think knowing what could be a potential reason for um, the ex recurrent exacerbations and maybe paying a little more attention to environmental exposures in terms of pollution uh, would give us a little more hint as to what could be done or what could be documented. Um, the last slide I think that I have uh, was another rabbit hole that I went down, uh, air pollution and climate change, and there was too much to read. Um, I, I found myself lost in papers and um, statements from across the world. I did learn one thing that we all know that air pollution with emission of greenhouse gases does contribute to climate change because greenhouse effect causes more warm uh, temperatures and eventually causes um, long-term effects. However, what I learned in addition to that was that more greenhouse effect causing in increased temperatures actually makes air pollution a little more um, active. It, so to speak, it acts as a catalyst. Um, these gases uh, that we know of, the carbon dioxide, the methane, ground level ozone, the black carbon, um, uh, warm the surface of the atmosphere, uh, eventually affecting the rainfall, retreat of glaciers, sea ice sea level, among other factors. I surprisingly came across a paper from Yale that talked about how aerosol, aerosols or fine um, aerosolized um, uh, matter or par particles actually cool the temperature of the earth. And there was this whole debate after that paper because it was coming from Yale if that aerosolized chemicals are actually helping us and not causing global warming as fast as they would have if there were no aerosolized chemicals. And then there are the subsequent studies that followed and that refuted that claim. Um, so that was a surprise and a learning point, an interesting uh, point that I uh, learned about. I think the last slide that I have is list of air pollutants, which is right here, the greenhouse gases uh, and the impact, of, uh, impact on human health. Um, particulate matter, we know that has is there as an air pollutant and impacts human health? We know that about the sulfur dioxide, the nitrous, the ground level ozone is all three. 
carbon monoxide, uh, black carbon, all three, is a greenhouse gas, a pollutant, and impacts human health, and methane is also ticked on all three. I think that's about my last slide. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, that was wonderful. We really appreciated that. Um, and we did have some questions come in during that, but uh, let's see, but super appreciative. Um, let's see, let's see. We had a question about your number of days slide. Um, what is the meaning of the numerator data there? Number of days, give me one second. Absolutely. One was the number of days. Mm. Can we uh, significant and that had gone down, but I couldn't understand exactly what the numbers on the on the bars represented. If you could put that back up. Yes. I could not hear half of your question when you were speaking. Could you repeat it, please? I didn't understand what numerator numbers referred to on the bar graph. And the number of days that air quality um, reached significant levels. Because it was in 35 cities, but then there were these numbers like 1,100 and 1,200 and 850. Okay, this slide here, right? Um, we don't, we don't, yeah. see you'll have to reshare. Sorry. I gotcha. Give me one second. Oh, I can't find my Zoom. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. This one here? Yeah. Yes. To be honest, I actually would have to look into that. My understanding of this, and I could be wrong, uh, because I did uh, find myself struggling with most of the data. My understanding of this is uh, the unhealthy sensitive groups or air quality index uh, based on the national uh, or EPA levels and what those states had on an average. Uh, but the number of days reaching, I, I see your point in terms of what that exactly means. And I could get back to you on that to, so that I don't, I don't, you know, uh, misquote the actual data on, on here. Okay, thanks. Thank and, you. And it's clear, but I was just trying to try to understand exactly what those numbers are. I mean, maybe it's 35 times 365, and that's the denominator, and each of those is a numerator. Um, that's one possibility, but I wasn't sure. Yeah. We can definitely check into that and get back to everybody. I, I definitely will, because my understanding was more of an average in terms of, uh, you know, the, the states and the EPA levels. But I definitely uh, want to make sure that I had the right understanding and I'll, I'll get back to Caitlin and she'll distribute the, the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Did uh, we start sharing or? No, we we're still sharing right now. We can. That's okay. I was just looking for my screen there. Oh, <laughs> um, everybody, you're welcome to unmute yourself and or and or chat in, and I could ask the question for you. Any questions you have? I'm so happy to see everybody on. We've we've got a great group of people on today. Um, Dr. Doyle asked a question regarding um, the, the ozone uh, uh, question at the NPS. Yes, actually, it was one of the aha moments where we said, please ask the patient to get rid of that. And I looked into this. There are a lot of options that you can buy online, these gadgets that make ozone in the house, and it's supposed to clean your air. They're not regulated. You can buy them and, and I, I believe the patients who tend to have airway disease, asthma, COPD, they tend to think, oh, I, I'll have pure, more pure air in my house. And thankfully, we haven't, I haven't had many patients who bought this online. But yes, the, the exacerbations actually got better after removing the exposure of ozone. Dr. Kulpakar, the point of my comment was that we also, out here in primary care, treat thousands of exacerbations every year. And it's usually ho-hum, here's your Zithromax and prednisone. 
and use your nebulizer more often, but your nurse practitioner dug a little deeper and asked an important question. And so I really applaud her for doing that. And, and that's something we all have to try harder to do. And, and, and we generally are so stuck in our biomedical model of tests and prescriptions that we don't think about environmental factors other than secondhand smoke and firsthand smoke enough. So I, I thought that's a great, great anecdote. Um, I'd use it with medical students and residents. I couldn't agree more. I completely agree. The, the exposure history is so vital that when we see a patient in the clinic, we should be spending, at least from the pulmonary standpoint, 80% of the time is exploring the exposures. Definitely couldn't agree more. And I will pass on um, your comments to our nurse practitioner. Thank you. Everybody, we do have time for more questions, or if you have any patient case questions that may relate to this, we definitely have time for that. Um, Dr. Zulfiker, I wanted to let you know I really appreciated the West Virginia data you included. I think that was really great for everybody to see. Thank you. Likewise, it was eye-opening, and um, I actually wanted to put in some comparative data from, the, from some of the neighboring states, but then I thought it would get too long, and I didn't want to take up most of the hour that we had. <laughs> No, I appreciate it. Doctor, I do have a question. <clears throat> With some of our patients, say that we did find out that they did have this type of a purifier in their home. Um, and it was one that you had mentioned dealing with with ozone, promoting that into the, their home. Mm -hmm. Are there other types that you would recommend or feel that, you know, if they were, uh, maybe they live in the home with a smoker, or maybe they have a high allergen content in the home and they wanted this, would there be something else you might recommend? So most of the times we actually just recommend them to have, for example, a dehumidifier or an air purifier with a HEPA filter. And that's pretty much, HEPA. yes, that's pretty much one thing that we know tends to help. But any of the non-regulated uh, gadgets like these uh, uh, would, would definitely come, not be a recommendation for sure. And I, you know, I read, I read up a little bit about how come they are being sold online when we know that ground level ozone is clearly a pollutant. So uh, the description that they give in, in the website is when you turn it on in a room, you should not be in that room. Uh, you need to turn it on so that, for example, the the for the secondhand smoke, the smell of the smoke, and all, all of these air um, contaminants will be kind of washed away. So you close that room, you turn this on, you stay out, uh, and then you turn it off, open your doors and windows, and then go inside the room to sleep or stay or study. Um, I'm not sure how how effective that is um, in terms of removing the ozone that there is, but my patient or the NP's patient was clearly using it while sitting in that room, turning it on. But yes, other than that, the HEPA filters, dehumidifiers, the two main ways we ask our patients to, in a way, modulate their local environmental exposures. Thank you very much. All right, guys, any other questions, anything? I don't want to end too early, but I also don't want to keep anybody. Uh, uh, Caitlin, this is Dan Doyle. I mean, I don't know. I always have questions, but um, I'm going to hold up another couple minutes because <laughs> um, there might be some people who, who want to jump in. Sure thing. I hope so. Absolutely. Everybody, if you're having trouble unmuting, even if you want to talk, you can always just raise your hand or something and I'll click on you. Uh, I wanted to bring up a totally non-related question because this is a forum for, you know, chronic lung disease. Uh, regarding uh, black lung benefits, and this is completely off topic, right, so to speak. Uh, black lung benefits for a person who worked as an engineer around the coal mines, and I'm trying to look for suggestions um, or past experience. 
and now seems to have PMF lesions. Never worked in the mines, never inside the mines, never really wore equipment because he never had, as, as per his you know, perception, never had a lot of exposure, but now has very classic PMF lesions. He has never gotten a PFT while he was working, never got a chest X-ray because he was deemed to be not a high risk. And um, I was wondering if anyone had thoughts about that. He has never obviously enrolled into black lung benefits and now category B and going towards category C PMFs. If not now, then maybe later. Uh, I, I wanted to you know, at least see if anyone had en encountered something similar or had past experience. I'm hoping, I'm hoping Dr. Weissman will address this. Luann, go ahead. I was just going to say, I know um, at our clinic that we have um, black lung testing, we do counseling and so forth. Um, and that's something that I have learned through our black lung counselors, that there are patients that um, definitely qualify for black lung benefits that maybe that are not necessarily at the face or deep into the minds because they worked around it Maybe they were a truck driver. Maybe they were the guard at the guard shack. So depending on the situation, um, you know, they definitely could qualify for it. And like you said, you've, are, you've obviously seen um, indication with PMF for this patient. So ha have they applied? Have they done anything for application for it? No, uh, actually, I was the first person to tell him, based on his imaging and history, that he has black lung, complicated black lung, past Tuesday. Okay. I essentially did bring up if he had ever applied for black lung benefits. He said, well, not really, because I never thought I had black lung. And mm -hmm. his and his imaging, you know, it, it speaks right to you. Imagine having category B or C PMFs. Um, right. he, he did mention that he has worked world around. He used to go to different mines for, you know, across the world for as an engineer. So definitely had varied exposures in China, United States, Australia. He has traveled quite a bit. Uh, and I wasn't sure. I did tell him that I'll at least try to find out more about um, his clinical situation and the black lung benefits and how it would tie in. So uh, do you think that he, he would be at least um, able to apply for the black lung benefits? My thought was yes. It, I'm not a, a professional by any means as far as um, knowing all the ins and outs with this, but if he has a certain year exposure um, in West Virginia, um, he definitely can qualify. Is he currently working or is he disabled or? He has retired from his uh, engineering job three years ago. Okay, um, who do you, do you have contacts up there? Like I know with our clinic, we have two um, physicians that help with ours, Dr. Warrens and Dr. Allen. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that Dr. Warrens would be more than happy to talk with you. Mm -hmm. um, but our black lung counselors also know the ins and outs of years exposure and who to contact and that type of thing. Um, do you have ones that do that up in your area that you can contact? Yes, we do. Okay. Yes. And, I, and that's going to be my next step this week, contacting them and, and seeing if, if we can tie this in. And I found it really interesting because um, it was, uh, he was getting evaluated for cancer. Oh, wow. Yeah, he came to our cancer clinic saying that, oh, I have something in my lung, it's a mass. Well, lo and behold, you look at a CT scan, bilateral, symmetrical, central, uh, can there be cancer still? Absolutely, but uh, nobody had ever told him that he had black lung. Um, wow. And I told him that it's, a, it's more of radiological and clinical you know, um, diagnosis that I'm giving him. No one, no one can be 100% sure, but he, had the, all the, he checked all the boxes for um, wow. Okay, definitely. We're here to help. If there's questions you have, um, we can be in contact with you and vice versa. We have um, some excellent contacts in the area as well that know the, the, they're the black lung counselor gurus that can really help work through things. That would be great. Thank you so much. If you could sure. send the, you know, your contact information to Caitlin and she can share it with me, that would be wonderful. Sure will. Thank you. Uh, this is Grace and Donny Koppel. I just want to be sure that all of you received and digested the returning with care, um, the uh, considerations for reopening pulmonary rehab 
that were issued last week by the American Association for Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Rehabilitation. And uh, I'm sure that's something that you're all working on within your own clinics. But uh, maybe some of you would share, A, whether or not you're open, and B, whether or not you, how, you're, how you're grappling with these considerations. Hey, Sam, this is Luann. Um, yes, we did get your information. I appreciate that very much. Um, we have, our director has been in um, working with um, several of, with Dr. Doyle, Dr. Warrens, trying to um, coordinate a game plan uh, to uh, start slowly integrating those different protocols. And uh, it, is, it is a work in progress because we want to make sure that everybody's as safe as can be. So. Um, we have things that we're looking at, maybe um, or things to install or to move certain equipment or do different things so that when we do bring patients back in, that there is social distancing, that they are wearing appropriate PPE as well as we are. And then when we actually do our PFTs and testings to um, keep that as safe as possible as well. So we appreciate you giving, in, in addition to some of the other information that we've received, um, we're compiling that together. This is David Weissman. I just wanted to jump in on the previous discussion about what was a minor. Uh, I was sort of struggling with my mute here. Yeah, and, uh, and the MSHA definition is that a minor is a person including any operator or supervisor who works at a mine and is engaged in mining operations. The de definition includes independent contractors and employees of independent contractors who are engaged in mining operations and construction workers who are exposed to hazards of mining operations for frequent or extended per, uh, periods. Uh, the definition does not include scientific workers, delivery workers, customers, uh, vendors, or visitors. So basically, uh, uh, the person who you described, Rafia, uh, who, is, who was actually engaged in mine operations would fit the MSHA definition of a miner uh, and, and ought to be eligible for benefits. Thank you, Dr. Wiseman. That that's really helpful. Yeah, I want to add to that uh, the fact absolutely that person is eligible to apply for black lung benefits, both at the federal and the state level. Um, if, if he's in West, whatever state he's in, but if it's West Virginia, West Virginia, he's absolutely eligible on the, on the state side. It's and his state of last exposure, there are time limits on applying for state benefits. I believe there's no time limit, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Weissman, on applying for federal black loan benefits. And, um, and in fact, if you, with the lesions you're describing, that is, um, that is, in fact, not, is sufficient to qualify for a federal black lung if you have complicated or PMS. So he he will probably get that if he applies. And if he dies before his spouse, she will probably uh, be able to benefit from that. Um, and the other thing is there's an article in Lancet in May. You, I'm sure you'll be able to track that down, Dr. Zoltan. We've been circulating it around here. It's actually a case report from a black lung clinic that is, a, that is part of our APHP group. Uh, it's the Stone Mountain Health Services in Southwest Virginia. And together with Dr. Harris, a pulmonologist at UVA, who's their medical director for the Black Lung Clinic, they published a case report in Lancet this month describing a case that sounds very much like yours of a coal miner who had what remarkably limited, what they thought was remarkably limited exposure, maybe something like three or five years of underground work. And, and it's very, very common that our coal miners with PMF have been worked up for cancer two or three or five times because they go to different places and they keep getting PET scans and CT scans and, um, and CT scans every three months follow their lesions. Um, so I would check that out uh, because it, it discusses it. Dr. Harris, Dr. Harris, over at UVA at Paul, he's, he's, I think, like you, a young pulmonologist, like an academic. Thank you for 
referring me to that. I will definitely look into that. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's really cool and appreciated. Uh, sorry, Dr. Weissman, you're welcome to comment. Well, no, 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 go ahead and finish this conversation, but I wanted to ask Grace Ann a question after we finish talking about the coal mining. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, I appreciate Dr. Doyle bringing up that there is limited time for, um, for state application and stuff, but federal application shouldn't have a time limit. Um, and also I wanted to, to uh, tie back into the other one. I love that we're having all of these great conversations that we've had a lot of comments in the chat about reopening um, cardiac rehab. We've gotten several people talking about how they're, let's see, spacing people out, screening patients, everybody's wearing the proper PPE and having patients wear PPE, let's see, uh, restarting PFTs in negative pressure rooms, that's great, with PAPRs. Um, and everybody is welcome to, of course, go and read the chat. Scheduled, every, a lot of people are scheduled to reopen and some places are even doing one patient at a time. Totally understand. It's great and I love that everybody's sharing exactly what's going on. It's wonderful. Sorry, Dr. Weissman, now, the floor is yours. No, I just wanted to ask Grace Ann if she knew when the American Thoracic Society recommendations for re reopening PFT labs will come out. I have no idea. Um, they were supposed to issue something at least, I think it was two, two or three weeks ago, and they still have not reached consensus. But as to the returning with care considerations, there was a wonderful webinar last week that was about an hour or an hour and a half in length. And uh, a number of uh, clinic directors and physicians uh, indicated the approaches that they were taking. Uh, and for example, uh, rather than people moving from one piece of equipment to another during the exercise portion of the clinic, they are remaining on one piece of exercise equipment because the kind of cleaning and sanitation that you would need to do is just, um, it's too dangerous for the patients and for, for others. So that the modifications that are being made, uh, a, number of, a number of clinics have opened and they are following most of these recommendations. If, if equipment is not to be used because you can't space it properly from the next piece of equipment, they're covering it with sheets so that people do not go to it, not merely putting an X over it, but covering it with a sheet. Now that sheet might come off for the next class because that might be an appropriate piece of equipment. But if you read through the two documents that I sent, the one graphic and the other document, I think then you can begin to tailor things for your own needs. And I think that's important to do. And it may be since, since we're all part of the same group, that the group guidelines specific to uh, pulmonary and cardiac rehab in West Virginia should be developed. And I would look to people in this group, I'd be happy to work with them to achieve that objective. Because um, in general, we, we are, you know, it's not like the, uh, the big hospitals. There are special circumstances. So I think it would be very helpful and I'd like to know from, from all of you, if you feel that, that local guidelines should be adapted for the, for the Grace Ann Dornick clinics, for example. Uh, thank you so much, Grace Ann, um, for all of that. Uh, everybody, you should have received that. I'm sorry, I'm blanking just a little bit, but it, either Thursday or Friday of last week is when that was forwarded out to you. I know we only have a moment left. Um, our next session is on June 15th, and it's actually going to talk, we're, we, we've decided to just have a whole session focusing on this. Um, a lot of people have talked about or had questions about how to do PFTs and how to reopen appropriately and everything. Hopefully ATS will have their stuff out um, so we can talk about that as well. Dr. Um, Sunil Sharma, he was here last time or the time before, I'm not sure. Um, he's gonna come and return and do a didactic about this topic. Um, I've asked him to keep it short so we can have um, conversation and stuff. And I think Dr. Wernz is going to kind of do what I do in a better, 
better way of facilitating the conversation for that. Um, so any questions, comments, resources, definitely bring to that, that meeting. And is there anything else that anybody needs? I know we're right at the end of time now. And Dr. Zulfikar, I just want to thank you so much again before we end, because that was wonderful. We really appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. All right, my friends. I'll see you guys later. Everybody have a wonderful day and week. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.